good. He's so good. I want to take a second and I want to read about faith. It's, it's faith. We need faith. Amen. And Hebrews 11 says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. It is the evidence. Evidence is proof. Faith is our proof. Through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that, that we now see, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought, more accept, brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For he was taken up. He was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Amen. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. And that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about the things that had never happened before. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. Your righteousness comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and to go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. He went without knowing. And it's easy to, to read these stories and 
and, and have faith in these people because we know the end. We know the end of their story. We might not know the end of our story, and it's hard to have faith, but God knows the end of our story. God knows our destination, and we have to have faith to reach it. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and too old. She believed that God would keep his promise. And so a whole nation came from this one man who was as good as dead. A nation with so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All these people died still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it all from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads on here, here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for a country, for, if they had longed for the country they came from, they would have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac to, to, as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac, this is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. God told him, this is the son from whom your descendants will be counted, and he said, sacrifice him. Abraham had the faith to do that. He, he believed that what God promised him was true, and he was still give, ready to give, up, give it up because he knew that God could do it. Abraham reasoned that, his, that if, his, if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. That's faith. That is faith. And in a sense, Abraham did receive a son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each, and jo each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently to the people of Israel, that the people of Israel would not would leave Egypt. He even con commanded them to take his bones with him when they left. He knew it would happen. It was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an un unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Yeah. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept, kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who was invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea, as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who received to obey, refused to obey God, for she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take a lo too long to recount the stories of faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. It was by faith these people overthrew kingdoms. They ruled with justice and received what God has promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle, put, put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back from death, but others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prison. Some died by stoning. Some were sawed in half. And others were killed with a sword. Some without wearing skins of sheep. Some went, without, went about wearing she, skins of sheep goats, dis, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All of these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them received all of what God promised. For God had something better in mind for us, so that they would not reach perfection without us. You have to have faith. 
look at all those stories. None of those, none of those stories would have happened if they hadn't had faith in who God said he was. And the faith in his truth, because God is truth, God is certain. God is our evidence, our faith is our evidence in what God is and who God says he is. And I might be broken, but my faith has made me whole. And I have faith that my God has made me whole. I believe God makes me whole. And I believe that he can use a mess like me to make a difference. I'm broken, God, but God, use me. I know you can. Use us, God. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty-handed but not forsaken.
broken to life. I was dead before God came into my life. But he breathed life into me. He breathed life into me. And I was able to have hope to keep going. And my faith has made me whole. My faith in who God is and who he tells me he is because he is truth. He does not lie. He does not fail. My God is so good. He is so good. Give your God some praise glorify his name this morning he's so good and let's give our pastor a good hand as he comes how many of you glad that you know what she's talking about this morning aren't you glad that God didn't call you way back thousands of years ago to build a boat leave your family and just head out in the desert how many of God doesn't do the same thing but he will test your faith and prove himself in some area of your life. How many know that it's true? Let's give the praise team another nice thank you. Love you guys so very much. Amen. Appreciate it so much. We appreciate the work of God. We appreciate the ministry and all the rest. You may be seated if you like this morning. I'm just blessed because this is a, a, an amazing new season. And you know the reason is Haley was talking about all the people of faith and the different stories of faith. Really a synopsis of all the old covenant put together in just a chapter. Chapter 11 is uh, amazing, but at the same time, every one of us in this room either believe that God's going to bless your life in the future and you're excited, or you don't believe Him and you're depressed. I mean, it's a choice. You have to either decide I'm going to believe God and be happy, or doubt God and worry myself to death. Say it with me. It's up to me, and I've chosen to believe God. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to trust God. He's never failed, so why not? He can't fail, so why not? How many know everything you commit into his hand, he will keep it against that day. So you don't have to worry about any of those circumstances and situation. Anybody feel like you're blessed this morning already? How many got out of bed in your right mind? How many got here without running into somebody's driveway or garbage can or mailbox like my neighbor did to me? <laughs> I'm not asking you to pray for my mailbox. I'll get another one. But how many know that sometimes people are, come very close to the end of their life because of a, a, a moment, just a little ice on the road or something they didn't foresee? And the last few weeks, the Lord has been dealing with me a, a very strongly because there's a war going on. And this year, we're going to win this war. But you can't win the war if you don't get involved in it. And you don't get involved in letting God have the war. He always wins, but you have to give it to him. Anybody still fighting the battle? You know you can't win it. Worrying about your family. You know you can't fix them. God can, so give them to Him. Trust the one that has the power. Well, I'm preaching real good right now. More than you're saying, amen. I'm going to ask if you have a notepad or an iPad or something. Write down a few things as we go along. Just whatever stands out in your life. Because we are a people of destiny. It's not a word that's real common now. We don't talk a lot about it. But looking back in the stories, as we heard this morning, of the people that were willing to fulfill their destiny. Can I just say it? God has given you a destiny, and there's one that is out to stop it. It's not about you. He doesn't hate you. He hates what God can do through you. You're of little consequence to the enemy. What you can do for God is of all consequence to him. But if God has given you a destiny, expect to fight for it. The enemy comes to do three things, kill, steal, destroy. It's all he knows how to do. He uses all of his lies because he doesn't know how to tell the truth, has never told the truth, to try to rob you. And I want you to mark this down, if you will. It's very important. This, this morning, I want to talk about every one of us and admonish you to be very, very careful to guard your destiny. Nobody can do that but you. Nobody can take it away from you. No one can destroy the benefits of your destiny but you. I can destroy mine, but I can't destroy yours. Now look at this. I can influence you. And I can be a bad influence and help to abort your destiny if you're not guarding it. 
How many of you know we all are responsible to guard the destiny and the future of the plan of God that's in our life? And what's beautiful about this is we get to be a blessing to somebody. Is anybody in the room a blessing? Six? Well, that's kind of arrogant, isn't it? You're supposed to be a blessing. When you walk in the door, everybody ought to get happy. If when you walk in the front door, people leave the back, I'm not talking to you. Come on, Brother Price, some people are so full of negativity when they walk in the room, it feels like a dozen people walked out when they leave. How many just realize we're supposed to be a blessing? Yeah. Say it out loud, I'm a blessing. You yeah. might have to work on that a little bit, but how many know we are a blessing? Amen. Now, let me just say this, it's very important, just a few points I want to make. Destiny can be aborted if you quit. It can't be aborted just because you fall down and mess up. It's aborted when you just quit. Because nothing happens when you quit. You've gone as far as you're going to go once you quit. How many have ever quit for a minute? How many decided that wasn't going to work, so you started all over? Come on, we all do that. We fall down, we quit. But notice this, the Lord that began His work in you, He knows how to prompt you. No, God knows how to make you so miserable you won't want to quit. And when you quit, you'll want to unquit. Write that down, that's a tweetable moment. I don't know if it's a word, but I just made it up, and I'll call that Cherokee. Is that okay? Destiny can be temporarily aborted only if we choose to quit. Look at this. Destiny can be greatly hindered by one act of disobedience. Has anybody ever been dis- Don't raise your hand. Anybody ever been disobedient? And, and, and how did that work out for you? There's no benefit by disobedience. All through Scripture, God warns us time and again what happens when we don't hold on to our obedience before Him. I can be obedient to God and nobody like me, but that's all right because God likes me. God is the one that has given me my destiny. He's given me a plan, and He's the one that will fulfill that plan. If everybody walks out of my life, and I've had a couple of times where that almost completely happened in my life. But God didn't leave me. He didn't stop working on me. He did not abort the destiny in my life. Why? Because even though I was weak, He said, when you're weak, say you're strong. It's not a lie because you're leaning on the strength of God, not according to your own ability. I want us to get this because God is going to... Can I say it? He's going to help you guard your destiny if you're willing. We don't realize sometimes the power of destiny all through Scripture. And as Haley was going through all all of those stories this morning, it reminded me that sometimes it was just one person that had an entire nation hinging on their act of obedience. If Abraham had not left Ur of the Chaldees, the moon worshippers, to serve God, there would not have been a nation of Israel. If Sarah had not held on for 25 years to believe for a baby boy that was going to be a part of that catalyst for a nation of of children coming out of her womb, and if God had not been faithful, it would have aborted the plan. you got to realize there's a man named Esau that was wrestling in the womb with his twin brother Jacob. He did not regard his destiny. And when's the last time you ever heard anybody write a book about Esau? He aborted his destiny. God had originally planned was the firstborn should get the blessing. It should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But he sold it for one moment of temptation in his flesh. Every one of us fight our flesh. Or or we should. Because I've met some people that don't even fight their flesh. They just do it. How many of you realize God wants you to be a warrior to fight the number one battles, not your neighbor, not the boss, not the government. We need to learn how to fight this thing right here. I'm not talking about your skin. I'm talking about your conscious man, your natural man, your carnal man. That's the thing that you're going to. And let me just say, I don't care how old you are. You will have to contend with him all the days of your life. You'll always war with your flesh. Amen. Amen. And some of us in the house know what happens when you yield. You, you yield and you fall away and the blessing doesn't come. Can, can I just give you something? Because in this little story and what God is saying, there are so many of the people that we recognize. Because when I heard uh, Haley said earlier, she said, and Rahab was willing to hide the spies, the Israelite spies, that she knew they were going to take over her country. She knew they were going to conquer her family and her people. So she made up her mind. I am going to get an agreement with this God that I've been hearing about. What? 
what if she had said, I don't believe in that God. I don't believe the water of the Red Sea parted. I don't believe that God has fought the battle for the Israelites all the way across the desert. I don't believe any of that. If she had not joined together with her faith in God, she would never have become as the prostitute of Jericho. She would never have married the captain of the army, a man named Salmon. She would never have had children, and her children would have never become David and Jesus. What would have happened if she had aborted the opportunity to be the great great grandmother of King David and on down the line on the spiritual side, the physical side for Jesus the Christ? Amen. Be very careful in that moment of temptation because you don't know what you're about to lose. I've dealt all my life in counseling and ministry with men or women or young people or older people that they had a moment of weakness and a moment of temptation. They had an affair. And because of that, they had no clue that now it's going to mess their family. It's going to mess with their future. It's going to mess with everything in their life. And their children's children are going to be affected by that because it just takes one day to bring devastation to your destiny. You may not lose it, but you can be a strong opponent against yourself. And an advocate for the evil the enemy would like to bring to you rather than fight him and win. Anybody ready to start fighting for your faith? The Bible said we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. I'm glad that I have many, many times in my life I've been able to say no to myself. Anybody ever say no to yourself? Anybody ever drive by Dairy Queen and say, no, I'm not going to have that ch cookie dough blizzard? How many most of the time just yield and say, well, the Lord will bless it? I'll Pray the cat fat calories out of that. How many know that will only swell you up a little bit and after a while you'll get bigger? But how many of you know there are times when God says, I want you to obey me and what you do or do not do will affect your ministry and your destiny and the destiny of everybody you possibly could minister to for the rest of your life. Am I right? See, back in Israel, and this is such a hard area for me because in 1 in Samuel there's a story God was leading his people. They were winning wars. Their life was walking in victory and everything was awesome. And all of a sudden the people said, you know what? We, we don't want God to lead us by a prophet. Yeah, Samuel's awesome. He's amazing. He ha has the voice of God. He has the power of God. We win war and win battles. God is on our side. But we, we don't, we don't want to follow God anymore. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. Sounded like 2017, 18 to me. Don't tell me what to do. I don't think this generation is going to last much longer if people keep that attitude. Come on, I have people jump out in front of me in their car because they think, i got a right to step out in front of you because I'm special. Tell I almost clipped their bumper off. How many realize we have to have the right attitude in our spirit? Am I right? Every choice you make has a consequence. How many of you wish you'd go back and undo some stuff you did and make some hadn't obeyed this. Go on. How much you made some different choices? How much you just make your flesh wait sometimes? Quiet in this house. But listen very closely. This is important. The Bible said the people wanted to be led by a man. They wanted flesh to lead them. So they picked a big, tall, good-looking man. And when the prophet goes looking for him, he said, well, God, why don't, what have I done that they don't want me? God said, it's not that they don't want you, Samuel. They don't want me. They don't care about you. They don't want me in their life. Uh, uh, go ahead and give it the king they want. He anointed Saul, and for a little while, he was doing good. It didn't last very long. It doesn't have a, a real calendar of how long he did okay, but for a little while, he obeyed God. You know, there's some people get saved, and for a little while, they obey God. And then, then all of a sudden, they decide, I don't have to do all that. You know, I just, I'm just going gonna, gonna to be God. Make my own way. Oh, but it won't work. Let me just say, it won't work. Well, you know what? I don't need to pray. You don't need to talk to your only answer giver. I don't need to read. You don't need to read about your gift of eternal life. You don't need to know how to walk in victory. I don't need to be around Christians. You just want to hang around other folks. There's something wrong with that picture. I'm ashamed no longer to say it. It's true. You need me and I need you. Amen. I probably need you more than you need me, but how many know I'm there if you need me? And you don't need me, but you need the gift in me. And I don't need you, but I need the gift inside of you. Amen. I needed somebody to scrape off the ice in the front porch this morning. I said, well, you, could you do it without it? Yeah, but how many know it's a lot better when you have a dry steps to come to church in? How many know if everybody works together, we can get this thing done, and it's more effective? Let, let me say something heavy. 
when Saul decided that God gave him a command through the prophet, go and kill Amalek. It's time for that nation to die. They're getting ready to do great harm and danger to the nation of Israel. It's time when you came out of Egypt, they stood in your way. They didn't want you to get in the promised land. I decided not to deal with them then. I delayed my mercy and my grace delayed me wiping them out, giving them a chance. But now it's time because if you don't stop them now, they're going to stop you. And so God sent Saul and his army. They went to Amalek. And when all of a sudden they're fighting the battle and here comes Saul back home and he meets the prophet of God. The prophet says, uh, what, what, what are you thinking, king? And he said, oh, I obeyed the Lord, great man of God. He said, if you obeyed the Lord, God told you to kill everything that breathes, even the animals. I hear some sheep and I hear some oxen and I see that you got the king along with you as a prize trophy and, and all those people that you didn't kill. What do you mean you obeyed God? What he is saying is what I'm hearing in the church world right now. I obeyed God the way I wanted to. Wow. You know, we don't have to pray anymore. We can just buy a book on prayer and set it up on the shelf. Instead of praying, we just say, God, see all that stuff in that book? That's what's in my heart. I know that won't work when you're in danger. We need God for ourselves. Am I right? So the Bible said that when Saul looked at him, he said, I, I obeyed what God told me to do. And he said, well, no, you didn't. And he said, because you can't be trusted and obey God, God's going to take your kingdom away from you. He's going to give it to a man that will obey him. And he grabbed the robe of King Saul and ripped it off of him. And he said, this is a symbol. God's glory is not with you any longer. And you're not in the eyes of God. You'll be remain king in the eyes of men because they want flesh. But you'll never be in the eyes of God the leader. You know what happened at that moment? Saul had three awesome sons. We know Jonathan best because he was David's best friend. I just want to say this very strong. And I want to say it with, with all uh, unction because I need you to hear this. Jonathan should have been the king over Israel after Saul died, but his father's disobedience destroyed his inheritance and he destroyed his destiny and ended up getting him and his brothers killed on a battlefield because he could not, his father could not obey God. I want to say this, my life will affect you. If I decide to quit serving God, it will affect you in some way. It will affect my wife and children. Am I right? It could cause destruction and damage and harm and hurt. And so we can see it in leadership. Uh, 30 years ago, two of our major ministries fell. How many of you remember that? No name, no blame. And, and it hurt the church. We all got the blame for uh, what they did. And people would say, well, I thought God was real. I said, God is real. Just one of his children fell down. And what's amazing about it, both of those men are now bigger than they were when they quit. Because God knows how to restore. But along the way, they slaughtered the spirituality of multitudes of people I just got to say this I don't have a right to disobey God and hurt that many people well I can do what I want no you don't have a right to hurt God's kids Amen. and if you disobey God and walk in disobedience you will hurt God's kids how many we need each other are, are you afraid to say it I'm not afraid to say it. I need you elbow your neighbor and tell him I'm so glad you're sitting by me because I'd be all by myself if I didn't have you and if I need a word of encouragement you're the one that I would come to to bring me that one or, or something like that and so the Bible said that Saul is on the battlefield and when he comes home, he brings the king and the king is there as a trophy because Saul is so arrogant. Some people, their problem is money. Some people, they just got an ego. I have people in ministry, their, their problem is not money. Their, their problem is they just got an ego. I'm just trying to help you right now. You got to understand Saul, his ego is so big, he thinks he can obey God his way. And stand right in front of the prophet of God that he knows is of God and lie and say, I obey God while he's bringing all the spoils of war back with him and trying to blame the people for his disobedience. Nobody is fault for your disobedience but you. Nobody's at fault for my disobedience but me. I have to stand before God for what I do and I want to stand before God with clean hands and a pure heart. I want him to say well done and he's not going to say that if I haven't done well. Am I helping anybody? And so Saul realizes now the prophet is, is now stripped the ministry from me and he's going to anoint somebody else and, and it's going to affect me in a negative way. All God was saying is kill Amalek or they're going to kill you and your children. We're not living in that kind of a culture. But spiritually it's the same. If you don't deal with some problems that God tells you to deal with now, those problems will get so big they'll take you and your children later. 
Am I right? Destiny can't be aborted by anybody but you. For you. But you can abort the destiny of other people that you have influence over. Let me, let me go fast forward and we close out 1 Samuel and we get into 2 Samuel. It'll be a good study for you. The Bible said that David has been hated by Saul because Saul knew that David was anointed as the next king. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. David ran for a decade all over the nation hiding from the king. Many times he could have killed the king, but he said, no, that man one time was anointed and I will not touch any vessel that has ever been anointed. I feel like I ought to say this right now. If you're going to make fun of preachers because they mess up or some Christian because they messed up, I would advise you not to do that. If they've ever been anointed, God may be still working on them. And about the time you're putting them down, God's trying to pick them up. You don't want to touch the anointing of God. You're not anybody else's judge for anybody else's servant. It's all I can do to watch after me. The reason I'm speaking to you is because if it's working for me, I'm hoping it will work for you. The Bible says that David is having to come back into the country because the king has chased him out of, out of the nation of Israel. He finally comes back, and when he gets back into the area, he realizes, I'm going to be the king now. And a young man comes running up to him, and he said, what's going on, young man? He said, I just came back from the battlefield, and King Saul is dead, and his son Jonathan, your best friend, is dead. The boys are all dead. And David said, how do you know? He said, because I'm an Amalekite, which is the same people that Saul should have killed years ago and didn't. I'm still alive, and I was on the battlefield, and I watched your king Arrows in his body, about to die, and he's afraid the enemy is going to keep him alive and molest his body and shame him. So I saw your king with a spear under his armament, up under around his heart, but he's so weak he can't even fall on that sword and take his own life. The Japanese call it harakiri, Americans call it harakiri. It means to commit suicide by your own hand. Saul is going to take himself out. And he said... The young man that came to David said, I, I, I just came from Saul and I, I brought tokens that I was with him in the battle. And he said, well, are you sure it was him? He said, yes, because he asked me if I would get up on his shoulders and make him heavy enough to fall on his own sword. I helped to kill him. The anointed of God. David looked at him and said, what are you thinking? You touched the anointing of God and you didn't think it was evil. David had that young man destroyed immediately. Why was Saul on the battlefield defeated? Because he wouldn't obey God one day. On that one critical day, he couldn't say no to himself. He'd rather have a trophy king. He'd rather have spoils of war than to have the favor of God. That's what it boils down to. What do you want more than the favor of God? Probably one of my favorite and most hated scriptures of all because I see how this affects all of us and how it affected Saul in the future generations. Saul is now laying dead on the battlefield and the enemy comes by, Malachites, the same ones he should have wiped out before so they would never have a chance to harm him in his future. The Bible said they cut off his head and they took it to the walls of Bashan and they nailed his body headless to the wall as a reproach. The valiant Israelite men went at night and took his body off the wall and gave him a proper burial. Why did that happen? Because in one moment of arrogance and ego, I don't have to obey God, he allowed his enemy to remain alive. And the very enemy he allowed to remain alive is the same enemy that killed him in his future. Is anybody hearing this? Might as well, well, yeah, but David had to become the king. David was willing to wait. David ran to keep from having to kill Saul. He knew he was anointed, and he knew that one day the throne is mine. You know, sometimes there are disobedient people in your life because God has to move them out of the way to put you in your place. And God doesn't evil do anybody, but how many sometimes he knows our heart and he knows that in a season of time, I've got somebody in the wings, I'm going to come take your place because I can't trust you and you can't obey me. How many of you realize that in these moments we all get excited, the message is so serious, we say, boy, I'd never disobey God. The Spirit started speaking to me early last week and he said, warn my children because in this hour there's going to be temptations they've never had before. There's going to be attacks they've never witnessed before, and it's going to try to destroy their destiny. It's going to try to destroy their future. David was a valiant king. I'll close on this. David was a valiant king. He was God's, probably the most favorite still in Israel, the favorite king over all the Israelites for all these thousands of years. 
David fought battles, won war, brought victories, blessed the nation, blessed everybody in the nation. He was known as such a, a mighty warrior. He had 31 men that were his very best friends, and, and they worked with him, and he taught them, and just a few of them at a time could take on an army. They had the favor of God and the special presence of God with them, and they never lost a battle. But after David got a little bit older and, you know, got a little accustomed to his, his life and ministry, he, he decided not to go to battle. You know, sometimes we think we don't have to fight anymore. Sometimes we think we can do this God thing without talking to God and praying and reading the word. And we don't think, well, I'm strong enough, I'll just stay home. Parallel is beautiful right now. The Bible said that uh, that night while Israel army is fighting the enemy, he's walking on the wall and he looks around. He sees a young lady over there taking a bath. Something happened on the inside of him in a moment. Lust began to take over, and this time, after all the years behind him, this time of saying no to himself, this time he said to his servants, go bring her to me. I want you to hear this. Can I use myself a minute? It's not a story. It's not true, but can I use myself? Again, say it. It's not true, because I don't want this to get out. It's not true. What would happen in spirit of truth if I was to say, Hey, Trevor, come here a minute. Uh, there's a lady outside the wall taking a bath. Uh, go get her. Bring her to me. You know where my bedroom is? Bring her. You know what I just did? I destroyed his confidence in me. Amen. Everybody that found out why he's going and why he's bringing the woman back lost confidence in the king. Am I right? Amen. My soul, brother, and God doesn't care about that. That's your flesh. Oh, yes, it does. That's why we have divorce courts, because it does matter. And then the Bible said that David had an affair with her. She conceived a child and she came back shortly after and said, David, I'm, I'm going to have a baby. And David in his brilliance does a lot like we do. He said, you know what? I got to cover this up. So he called to the army. Captain said, send Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Send him back home, furlough. Got him in his presence and said, I want you to. You're such a good soldier. You're my dear friend. I want you to go home and spend some time with your wife. And, and then you go back to the war. And uh, I just want to honor you. Well, he thought that was going to work until the next morning they came and said, David, Uriah wouldn't go home. He slept out on the front porch because he said, I can't go home and visit my wife and enjoy my life when, when all of my best friends are about to die on the battlefield. I can't do that. He had more integrity than David had. He would not, he would not yield to his flesh, even though it was a right thing. So David said, well, let me bring him in and get him drunk. Let me try something else. How many realize when you start following temptation, you'll do stuff you never would have done before? You'll destroy your best friends without regard to cover up your mistake that you made one time, one night, one situation. So David writes out a note and he sends it to the captain of the army and he sends that note by Uriah, his dear friend, whose wife is the one that David's had the affair with. Can you get the picture? Uriah's got a note in his hand he's going to take to the captain of the army and the note says, the man that's holding this note, put him in the front of the battle and everybody just back up and let him get killed. When he's dead, let me know and my sin will be covered up. David gets a note a few days later and said, Uriah's dead. David said, yeah, how did I cover up my sin? Sin cannot be covered up. I won't say that again. Sin cannot be covered up. Nobody saw me. God did. But what if I'm in the basement with the lights out at midnight? God sees in the dark. I know God knows everything. Amen. Amen. And David thinks that everything's okay until he gets a knock on the door and there's a prophet named Nathan said, David, I got to talk to you about something. There's a guy in your kingdom. He's, a, he's rich. Thousands of sheep. And got a neighbor across the street that just has one lamb. He, his wife's dead. His children are gone. He, that, that lamb's all he has. It's his family. But the rich man that had all the thousands of lambs had a visitor and he decided not to eat one of his lambs, though he has thousands. He went across the street and got the lamb of the man that only had one. Killed it and fed it to his... David's anger began to rise. His steam started coming out of his ears and he started pronouncing curses on what kind of a man would do that. When he kind of simmered down a little bit, the prophet Nathan looked at him and said, David, you're that man. You could have any woman in Israel as your wife, but you chose to take your best friend's wife and God knows that you killed him to cover it up. David fell on his face and repented. I will say it again. David fell on his face and repented and look at me and God forgave him Amen. but the baby died 
well, I thought you said God forgave him. He did. But if you sow in the flesh corruption, you will in your flesh reap corruption. God will forgive you and you'll live forever in heaven. But you're going to have to put up with some stuff that you've sown in your flesh. How many when you get saved, that's your spiritual man. Your physical man is still going to have to tell some folks you're sorry. Am I right? You're going to have to make some stuff. Can I get an amen right here? Or, or you can just say, like, Tony, it's Carmen. Call everybody. Hope you can find the right person that you're wrong. That's an awesome story. Amen. Would you say this along with me? I have made up my mind not to have to put myself in a position of hurting that many people and destroying many benefits of my destiny. I have to make a choice. And I'm going to make the right choice. It bothers me. I went through a study this last couple of days. David's children. What a mess. Bathsheba, he marries her. And now she has another boy named Solomon. We know most about Solomon. But there's another son named Absalom. And there's another son named Amnon. These are David's sons. The Bible said that David found out that his son molested one of his own sisters. David was mad about it, but he couldn't really say much because his kids knew he had messed up worse than they did. I won't say it blanket, every one of us. Mom and Daddy, be very careful how you live your life. Your kids will suffer. David never could deal with his children in the area of sexuality because he knew he messed up too bad. They had no respect for him. Absalom, his other son, kills Amnon because he's mad that he molested his sister. I wonder what could have happened in the future with Amnon and Absalom if their father hadn't messed up that one night. How many know sometimes it's not a big, long, drawn-out thing? It's just one thing. Am I helping anybody? How many wish you had heard this message 20 years ago? Come on. How many, every one of us need to realize, as the body of Christ, 2018, spirit of truth, we're going to tighten up. Amen. Come on, say it, we're going to tighten up. Uh, that was kind of half-hearted, laughing kind of an amen. That's okay. I want you to be stronger at the ending of this year than you are right now. Amen. I want you to know God more intimately than you've known him in your life. I want you to be able to help quote a few scriptures along the way. I want you to know that every day that you've touched God, you've prayed, you've, you've sought God. But the price and I were talking yesterday and I said, the very first thing that I've learned to do in my life, I don't know what works for you before I ask the Lord for anything, before I ever praise Him for anything, I come before Him and I thank Him. I thank Him because I've got to enter in through the gate of thanksgiving and to get into the courts of praise. And I've got a lot of petitions. People call all the time. There's one in the hospital that's dying and there's one that just had a death and there's somebody that is going through a great affliction and somebody has as a cancer I've got to make up my mind every day I'm going to believe the report this day for whatever call comes in whatever negative thing comes that God is bigger than our situation and I'm not going to be very effective in encouraging you if I myself had a messed up last night how many believe that God's resur resurrecting a powerful church how many realize the Lord is coming for a glorious church and he says without a spot or a blemish or a wrinkle that doesn't mean zits and cuts, it means you are not covered up with your own mess. Am I right? How many of you believe that God will set you free from whatever is your weakness? Everybody seems to have a strongest weakness. Yours may be different than your neighbor's, but everybody has something that messes with them. So we all need each other. We need to hang out together. Brother Ben was talking about rooted. It's not just a Saturday night where people come and hang out. It's a time where the body encourages each other. Iron sharpens iron. We're strong and we're strengthening each other because these young adults are on fire with God. But they are still tempted. They're still fighting war. Am I right about it? And the closer you walk with God, the greater the temptation. The more God's going to use you, the more battles you're going to have to fight. I just got to say it. I have ministry friends over the last 50 years. I watch what happened when they fell down. Some of them never got back up. And their children's ministry that was valid was aborted because they didn't have anybody that they could go to. They, like David, were not able to deal with their children because of one situation they couldn't conquer. 
I'm going to tell you this morning, God is bigger than your strongest weakness. He's bigger than what you're facing right now. And he has the power to bring great glory to us. Let's everybody stand for a moment, if you will. <clears throat> when everybody say, I need this. We learn that Saul, Esau, rather, and Cain both aborted their lineage. Thousands of people standing outside the ark of Noah decided to disobey God. Decided not to want God in their life and listen to that righteous preacher, Noah. Thousands of people died in all of their destinies and their children's children's destinies drowned with them. Do you good to go down past Cincinnati and see the ark experience? The size of the ark is larger than a football field. Big enough to inhabit not only eight souls of Noah and his wife and their three sons and their wives, all animals multiplied. And to maintain that for a year. What would have happened if Noah said, that's too big of a job. I don't care about my kids that much. We'll just live as long as we can. When God wipes out humanity, he'll wipe us out too. Listen closely. One man lived in such a way before God that his three sons believed him. That a flood was coming. I'm going to say as a father, I want my children to believe that I love God. My children know I'm not perfect. Sometimes I'll actually eat a White Castle. It's not the unpardonable sin, but it's next to it. How many of you realize if your wife or your husband or your children don't believe in you, you need to start working at home. We're talking about winning the world. This year, we're going to start working on our own family. And the best place to start is with yourself. How many like to make a promise to yourself today that you're going to strengthen yourself? Nobody has to be around you to strengthen yourself. And can I tell you, your greatest, your greatest attack is going to come when you're by yourself. Amen. Not very many people are tempted while the praise and worship's going on. Amen. But just step outside that door. Am I right? You, you, you see something that reminds you of your past. Come on. You see somebody from your past. I didn't know this, but recently somebody that had been addicted to drugs was saying, the billboards, you know, they talk about billboards and talks about addiction. Sometimes I wonder if the drug pushers are not putting them up there to remind the people every time they see it, where they were, what they did, and it brings back a weakness. I mean, we're not living in a fair world anymore. That's why I need you to strengthen me, and you need me to strengthen you. I vow to you that I'll help you if you'll let me, and I'll let you know when I'm in need. I want you to pray for me. We need each other. We're going to fight battles we've never fought in our life, and we're going to win. Say it with me out loud. We're going to win this battle. I you to bow your head if you will, Father. I'm talking to you for me today. And I ask you, God, let every one of my brothers and sisters in this room make a commitment to you if they've been saved for decades that I know new temptations are coming to me. I know there's a war I've never had to fight before that's going to be in my face this year. There's going to be temptations and there's going to be threats and opposition. I've never had to go through it before. But I'm willing today to allow you to become my strength. Sweet Holy Spirit, you're the only strength that can conquer my strongest weakness. And I ask you to do those things for me that I cannot do for myself. I feel like this morning there's two or three people that are on the verge of making decisions that you're going to have to have the power and the strength and the anointing of God to make or you're going to make the wrong choices and it's going to have a heavy ramification upon you and your children and your children's children, your siblings and your parents and your friends. All our head is bowed if there's one person in this room that you don't feel like you can conquer whatever your strongest weakness is right now. I'm going to ask you to come and receive the Lord's strength. The battle is not yours any longer. Once you give it to God, He'll be right there with you. What about David on the wall? Why didn't God help him? He didn't ask God's help. God was present, but He didn't ask God's help. God's presence and His help is always available for every one of us it's available for every situation it's available for every circumstance what I've learned in 50 years in ministry is sometimes when people are going through the biggest battle of their mind and the battle of their temptation that's when they put on the biggest air and act like all is well my brother my sister my friend you don't have to put on an act if you're weak let the Lord allow the Lord to become your strength he is your strength. 
He is your way maker. He is your provider. Some of you are not long away from your strongest weakness. You're not far away from the last time you fell down. I'm not saying that to put you down. I'm simply saying you are in the presence of a God that is not here to beat you up, not here to remind you of your past, but a God is willing to start all over and begin to make you stronger than you've ever been so you won't keep fighting that same battle that almost destroyed you before. I ask you for your quickening strength, O oh Lord. I ask you for your power. Come and stand with me if you will. Come and stand with me if you will. Try to step up a moment. This is a very private time this morning, but if you're fighting and you're struggling, much of everything, what about sinners? This is a salvation station for sinners. We've all needed it. And often we need to be refreshed and restored and renewed. But right now I'm talking to those, if you're not a child of God, I'll stay all day if I have to to pray with you. Please don't leave without knowing that you belong to God and that God is your life and your strength. If you will, I want you to point your hand this way and pray for our brothers and our sisters as the ministries are. Father, I praise you now because the battle is no longer Joshua's, it's yours. And I ask you, Father, let him, having done all to stand, just stand because this battle is going to end up the way you've chosen. And you're going to strengthen him in this area of our strongest weakness. I praise you now because he's honest enough to say, I need you, God, and I want you, God, and you're going to do for me what I cannot do for myself. I ask you for the Holy Ghost right now to empower him, fill him up and overflow in such a way that whatever has been strong before will become nothing than an enemy defeated under his foot. I release you to the strength of God and the purpose of God for your life and for your future, for your calling. Release the commanded blessing, strength, O oh God, to say no to herself, to say no to those things that tempt those things that were dissolved. I command the commanded blessing. And the battles are ours, but now they're God's. No longer ours because we've chosen to give them to Him. And Father, as she stands, she does not stand alone. She stands with the lineage of her family and her loved ones and a plethora of people that are holding strong in her heart. And God, there's always that danger in her mind knowing it would just take one moment, one act of temptation, one act of disobedience, one act of yielding to lose a loved one, to lose a friend, to lose a child, to lose a, a, an uncle or an aunt, to lose somebody that has not yet made their commitment. So I'm asking you, Father, to make her stronger than she has ever been for this year. I'm claiming this year there's gonna be an entourage as she is the Pied Piper begins to bring forth blessings and souls back to the kingdom that feel like they can do without you. I ask you, Father, let her have the word in season, the anointing in season, for not only her loved ones, but everyone that she comes in contact with. As she strengthens us as well, I claim it, and I call for that kind of a victory for the glory of God. Father, I thank you right now. The battle is not yours any longer. The battle is the Lord's. You know we all have your back, but when the enemy attacks, it's not when we're all together, sitting around a coffee and a donut. The greatest temptation comes when we're all alone in the dark. The temptation comes when the thoughts are bigger than we are for a moment. I thank you, Father, because you've got a mighty destiny inside of Cody. You've got a tremendous calling upon his life. This covenant that you've given him and this destiny inside of him, it will affect his father's house and his mother's house. It will affect everyone that he's met. And I ask you, Father, let him, having done all to stand, just stand because his feet are shod with preparation. And I thank you because he's going to sound an alarm in the days before us. I ask you to make him one of the greatest leaders that we've ever known. Strong because of you. Powerful because of you. Because in you there is no yesterday, there's only now and tomorrow. I release him for the strength of his ministry and for the fulfillment of his destiny. In the name of Jesus, we agree. We give you the praise and the glory for that. Everybody in agreement, say in Jesus' name. I'm not going to force you with this, but would you lift your hand along with me? Lift your hand to your God. And just like David on the wall that night could have said, God, help me. Help me. My temptation is more than I can bear. I want you and I to say together, Lord, I want your help. You're greater than my strongest weakness. You know the plan the enemy is concocting against me. And my loved ones and my destiny for this year, for this week, for right now. Give me strength, having done all to stand, just to stand. Because my feet are shod with preparation. In other words, I put on your word. And I will walk in it. And not yield to my flesh. 
Fulfill my destiny, Father. It will glorify you for now and for all of eternity. I claim that in Jesus' name. Now let's lift our hands and pray to him because freedom has come. Freedom has come. Freedom from the limitation of our flesh. Power to recognize the enemy. Hear his voice and recognize his devices. To remain strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And Father, for every flu, bug, germ, pneumonia, all of that, I rebuke it right now from the body of Christ. I ask you to begin to build up our immunity. Whatever comes in our nostrils, whatever we breathe and eat and whatever we take in, let it become immunity and health and strength from this day forward. I claim that in Jesus' name. Would you touch your neighbor and tell him everything is going to be all right? Come on, let's magnify the Lord and say everything is going to be all right. Amen. You may be seated for a moment if you'd like. There's healing in this room, but the greatest healing I need and the greatest healing you need is healing for our spirit, healing for our flesh, and healing for our carnal nature. How many know the Lord knows how to give us power over ourself? How many believe this word is in season and it's for us right now? So whatever you're going through, if you decide, I don't need what the preacher has to say, you will need to be reminded later and I'll probably have to come and bail you out again. How many of you understand? We need each other. Life is a lot easier if we walk in obedience than to have to fall down and get picked back up. How many would like to be strong enough that you don't have to fall in the same places ever again? Can we do this thing? I'm glad we have each other's back this morning. You know why I think the scriptures are in, written the way they are is because even though David was the most awesome of all, he had a moment. I think God wants us to know that we have a moment. How are we going to react? You will have a temptation. That's not the issue. How are you going to react? Those stories are given for us to have a warning. They're not to scare us. They're to show us what happens when we walk out of the obedience and yield to our flesh. How many believe that God has strengthened you in your area of weakness? He's strengthened you for your future. That's why we're here together. That's why Tuesday nights are important. Amen. Some of the most awesome services we have. Kathy's revealing some heavy stuff, some powerful stuff, but it's strengthening us for the journey that's before us. And I'm very thankful for that. I